this evening and to make that as palatable as possible for you we are going to present the trombone in different costumes uh, different settings that Richard Carr by Domenico Gabrielli was originally written for cello his instrument and we're going to stay in cello mode for a little bit here uh, as we go on to the next piece we'll also be staying how shall I put it with that old music. Uh, we'll be advancing from uh, Gabrielli's Renaissance a little bit into Marcello's Baroque. The Baroque era as portrayed in painting, music, architecture, it's very decorative, very ornate. And you may want to listen for those qualities in the music, especially as themes and passages occur a second and a third time will be decorating them with ornaments. Now, there is a whole discipline of historically informed early music performance that has really blossomed in recent decades, and we can learn a lot from that. Um, even when not playing on period instruments, there are certain styles and inflections and articulations that, that really help this music come to life. Uh, in my estimation, uh, historically informed music performance was best summed up by Duke Ellington, who told us, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. So uh, we, needn't, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the music must come alive. Uh, on an, a personal note, this is a little bit of a milestone for me this evening, this recital. It's the first time I have performed a recital from my iPad. And, and so I've worked hard at You'll see me tapping the screen to turn pages, and I've tried very hard not to moisten my fingers before making those page turns. So, enjoy with us, please, the Baroque swing of Benedetto Marcello's Sonata Number no. 6. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you again. Um, any of you or us who have grown up in this country learning a band instrument, these would be people my own children call bandos, um, should know the name Voxman, H. Voxman, Jaime Voxman, who, last I was informed, still plays his clarinet every day at the age of 98 in his Iowa retirement home. Anyway, Voxman compiled, collected, annotated, arranged, transcribed a lot of material for the Rubank methods that many of us know and have worked from. The capstone of which is for each instrument a concert and contest collection. Now, the Hal Leonard Publishing Company is in the process of re-releasing these venerable collections, one for each instrument. And with the re-releases, they are including a CD of performances of all the repertoire in the collection by professional musicians. And I was pleased to 
be chosen as the alleged professional to record both the trombone and the euphonium books a couple years ago, and they are available. And we would like to present uh, selections from the trombone uh, collection here this evening. Each piece was chosen for a particular reason. The Kepke Prelude and Fanfaronade, because it is the only fanfaronade I have in my repertoire. And uh, I would only mention that the word fanfaronade has nothing to do with fanfare. Uh, I'll leave it up to your research to further pursue that. The Tchaikovsky Waltz, originally for piano alone and upgraded to include a slide trombone, uh, I, I chose because it just portrays such beautiful motion and movement. We know the Tchaikovsky ballets, the great ballets, Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty, uh, and you'll get a, a hint of that uh, in this waltz selection. And Gabriel Párez's Twilight is just a beautiful musical painting. Uh, and I just like pieces that describe something. And I'll save a couple of comments for the concerto until right before that piece.
Thank you. You'll notice that Emil Lauga is the only composer in the program without dates after his name. Try as I might, I was unable to provide them for you, so he'll remain timeless here this evening. I can tell you, however, that he was the principal trombone player of the Paris Opera in the early part of the 20th century, and wrote this concerto for his own instrument, the trombone. I believe you'll hear the operatic influence. There are a couple of recitatives in the beginning, some very dramatic developments along the way, and a rousing finale at the end. Uh, after this piece, we'll have a brief 10-minute intermission.
chance to escape. <laughs> um, that whimsical whimsy was written by Brian E. Lynn, a trombonist in London, uh, known to us trombone nerds as a, a member of Taverner's Trombones or London Brass. Now, a piece entitled Whimsy would seem to give me license to speak about anything I like. And so I'd like to take this opportunity to say some thanks uh, very first, I would like to thank Carl Pei Lin for taking on this whimsically long uh, trombone recital on precious little rehearsal time. So my thanks to Carl Pei Lin. I would also like to thank Jeff Pirtle for his inspiration and dedication to this brass camp and everything he's making possible. Thank you to Jeff. I would like to thank Anderson University for hosting us in these marvelous facilities, and especially uh, in that context, Dr. David Jackson. Finally, I'd like to thank the B&S Music Instrument Company of Germany um, for taking care of all of my instrumental needs and helping to make my participation here possible. Now, we've had the trombone in some different costumes. We're going to put the trombone into a vocal costume for you now. Um, the similarity between the trombone and the human voice has been cited uh, frequently through music history. Uh, many people claim it's the instrument that comes closest to the human voice, and that fact is borne out in history uh, in a number of instances. The trombone was one of the very first instruments to be allowed into the church because of this vocal similarity. It was used to reinforce or sometimes even substitute for voices in the church choir. You see that usage further in the great sacred works by the likes of Mozart and Mendelssohn, Schubert, Brahms, where these great composers used the trombones to, uh, also to reinforce the choral lines uh, in their oratorios, masses, and requiems. Jumping ahead a few chapters in the history book, uh, Frank Sinatra uh, claims to have learned the art of phrasing and breathing from a trombone player, his first band leader, Tommy Dorsey. You'll hear more about him later. But the first two selections we're going to play for you here are composed by uh, Marco Bordogni, who was one of the great tenors of the early 19th century and was also a professor of voice in Paris for many years, wrote many vocalises for his students. Vocalises are vocal studies. 
And these are transcribed by a fellow named Johannes Rochu, who was a Frenchman and principal trombonist of the Boston Symphony Orchestra about 100 years ago. He transcribed these vocalises, uh, many, uh, three sets of them for our instrument, and they have become a very important part of our repertoire. So two vocalises by Marco Bordone. for a little bit. I think you could hear in those vocalises the similarity to, similarity to Bellini, Donizetti, Rossini. That was the exact period. Now, they say that all theaters are insane asylums, but the opera is the incurable ward. And if you've been bitten by the opera bug, you, you know exactly what, what that saying means. I had the privilege of playing in one of the great opera houses of the world for many years. and and incurable. We'd now like to play for you two of uh, two very well-known um, tenor arias from the opera. The first uh, from Verdi's Rigoletto, La Donne e Mobile, meaning woman is fickle. And the second uh, from Puccini's Torando, Nessun Dorma, no one sleeps. 
Coincidentally, I'll be playing both of these arias next week with the Denver Municipal Band. But for this evening, we have the entire orchestra in Palpe's hands. So, Rigoletto and Tuarno. Thank you. 
you ever so much. Now we've had the trombone in a variety of costumes here. Now we're going to let the trombone be the trombone. From here to the end of our program, every piece is written by a trombone player for trombone players. And the first one is Arthur Pryor, who was one of the true greats of the, of the great American band era a hundred and even more years ago. Uh, I'd like to read for you um, something I got from a record jacket way back upon a time because I think this is astounding. And you have to imagine Arthur Pryor uh, preceded and then overlapped, for example, with Herbert Clark. Um, I'll read to you here. Arthur Pryor, 1870 to 1942. Arthur Pryor, one of the great trombone virtuosos of all time, is a major figure in the history of great American band music. His father and his brothers were all active in the lively band scene of the day. But Arthur went on to become the most famous of the family. He was featured as soloist with the Sousa Band over 10,000 times in his 12-year tenure with that prestigious organization. Now, I know we're a bunch of bandos here, but I challenge you to do the math on that. 10,000 solo appearances in 12 years. Uh, it works out to, if you assume a six-day week, three solo appearance, appearances a day. Impressive. Now, he was also assistant conductor to Sousa. Through European tours with the Sousa band, he also gained international fame as an acclaimed soloist and was decorated by Tsar Nicholas II, who called him the Paganini of the trombone. Herbert Clark, renowned cornet soloist of the era, liked to tell of a concert in Leipzig, Germany, before an audience of 25,000 that upon the last notes of Pryor's solo erupted into a tumultuous ovation. Members of the esteemed Leipzig Gewandhaus Orchestra later greeted Pryor backstage and inspected his instrument, looking for some signs of Yankee trickery that must have enabled him to play with such unprecedented technical prowess. <laughs> they found none. <laughs> Despite his amazingly flashy technical feats, showcased effectively in many of his own compositions, Pryor himself preferred to perform slow lyrical ballads and operatic arias, as these portrayed the lyrical singing qualities of the trombone. His personal favorite was a sweet ballad, Oh, Dry Those Tears. Arthur Pryor left the Sousa Band in 1903 to form and conduct a band of his own, this band was quickly recognized as every bit the equal to the famous Sousa Band. In 1920, he retired from public performance as a soloist, but remained as a very active component of American band life. In addition to composing a variety of pieces, including three comic operas, he remained active by writing magazine articles on band betterment and traveling the country to conduct band clinics. He died on June 17, 1942, a monument to the great American band era of the early 20th century, Arthur Pryor. And we are going to play for you now one of his pieces, if I can turn my page. Hmm. That works. Called The Supervisor. Thank <laughs> you. 
evening. Now when we talk about the great trombonists, the name Tom, Tommy Dorsey has to be at the top of the list. Tommy Dorsey propelled the trombone into the public awareness and enthusiasm like no one before or since. It was a swing era. Our instruments, trombone, trumpet, saxophone, were in the mainstream popular culture, and Dorsey was a great band leader and a marvelous trombone player exhibiting all the lyrical qualities of the instrument, but also quite the technician. Um, in the 60s, as a, as a youngster learning the trombone, I can't tell you how many times an adult would come up to me and say, oh, trombone, Tommy Dorsey. <laughs> Your regular man or woman on the street knew Tommy Dorsey's name and knew his signature tune. Uh, and the title of that one is something like, I'm getting cement all over you. Uh, anyway, um, he died much too young, uh, in his, well, in his mid-50s, I believe. But he did compose a number of pieces, including this little recital piece for trombone and piano entitled Three Moods. Thank <laughs> you. 
So another big name in trombone, of course, J.J. Johnson, James Lewis Johnson, born in Indianapolis. Um, he propelled the trombone into bebop. We had swing and Dixieland, the trombone was very, very well associated with that. And J.J. Johnson went into bebop, putting the trombone at the same heights as Dizzy Gillespie's trumpet, Charlie Parker's saxophone. Um, he was also a composer of note. In the 50s, wrote a, a poem for brass at the encouragement of Gunther Schuller, which is a very good piece, a, a very early example of crossover between classical and jazz. Um, JJ later left active performing and went to Los Angeles to pursue a career as a composer, which he did, composing, among other things, film scores. He also wrote a piece for a concert band that many people don't know. Um, he moved back to Indianapolis and got back into performing, usually in New York then, but his home remained in Indianapolis to the end of his life. In his, in his last years, he wrote an etude book for jazz instrumentalists. And I'd like to play two selections from that for you, just because he's one of the greats and he wrote them. These are etudes without piano, so Qualpe can cool her fingers off a little bit here. First one, Jazz Etude 22. Finally, another great name in trombone, Jiggs Wiggum. Now, Jiggs is one of the great jazz trombonists of our age, unknown to many of us sometimes because his career has been in Europe. He's an American, uh, born in Cleveland, Ohio, as Oliver Hyden Wiggum III. Uh, his grandfather gave him the name Jiggs. Uh, Coming from Ohio, you, if you ever have a chance to hear his Buckeye Blues, I highly recommend it. But Jiggs' career has been in, in Europe, in Germany, in, in England, and he and I have crossed paths at a number of times over the years. It's always been a most pleasurable 
encounter. And in May, I was in Germany on business, and he was giving a, a clinic, and so I looked him up. He has good nerves. I didn't scare him at all, just showing up. And uh, he gave me a piece. He said, oh, here, you've got to, you've got to take this suite. I, I wrote it, and it's just been published. Um, I said, oh, great. Well, I'm working up some recitals for the summer. I'll, I'll do it. And so we're going to play it for you, a suite in five movements by Jig Wiggum. Jigs Wiggum. Uh, and this, I have to ask him, this may be the first American performance you're hearing here this evening.
Thank you. 